All right, from the title, you probably think this mini theory is just gonna be pure crack. And it's not crack, I promise. There is actually a distinct possibility that Zhang Li is some type of uh, adeptal royalty. Kinda. So this nutty idea came up when I was doing research for my beginner's guide to Liyue video. And I'm gonna proceed with this theory assuming that you've watched that one, or at least know more or less what happens in Liyue's history. If you do, you don't need to watch the video on it, it's just kind of... anyway. Specifically, this idea popped up while looking deeper into the actions and history of Guizhong. Even more specifically, where did she come from? Because we know that Morax came from around the area around Mount Tianhong. And so too should have his affiliated Adepti like Cloud Retainer, Mountain Shaper, Moon Carver, Sea Gazer, and Sky Bracer, but Guizhong kind of just appears out of nowhere. So I tried to reverse engineer her original territory based on her movements. The problem is, we only know a couple of them. First, she meets Morax in a field of glaze lilies. Second, she creates the Guizhong Ballista and she puts it at the foot of Mount Tianhong, which means she was down south. So then third, we know she moved her people to the north after the ballista was finished. And then fourth, we know she settles with Morax in the Guili Plains so that their total territory stretched from Mount Tianhong to Stone Gate, which is a massive spance of space. So originally, I was thinking it made logical sense that Guizhong came from the west in the Lisha region. Being a weak god, she could have been forced from her original territory by a stronger god, and then decided on an alliance with Morax as a way to gain a strategic advantage against that god, like, you know, hedging her bets, uh, building a little bit of uh, manpower and muscle, you know, that kind of thing. Then it would make sense for her to create a big weapon, like the Guizhong Ballista, and then aim at her old territory, then migrate north to the home of her new alliance in the Guili Plains. But that doesn't actually work. Because if Guizhong and Morax met for the first time in a field of glaze lilies, then they would have had to have met in the Dihua Marsh, since that's where those fields were before the area flooded. Which means Guizhong originally came from the north, most likely, and then she went south after meeting Morax, built a huge weapon, pointed it at whatever was in the west in Lisha, and then went back north. Which seems really weird, because why would she move her people back and forth from north to south? That just did kind of pointless, you know? And also, if Guizhong is from the northern area of Dihua or Luhua, since it's nearby and she has her domain in that area, then that begs the question, what in the ever-loving tartar sauce is in the western region of Lisha that Guizhong felt the name to point a ballista at? So now we actually get to the theory bit. Okay, so we know that Morax was the prime of the Adepti, so most definitely a leader of some sort. We know he taught his adeptal friends advanced techniques, such as subspace creation, because Madame Ping tells him he did. We also know that the Yaksha are a subset of the Adepta... Uh, race? I shouldn't really call it that. Adepti is technically a title, and so is Yaksha, both of which seem to be predominantly made up of illuminated beasts and possibly some ascended humans, kind of. Ping, you're still kind of up in the air on that. So it's complicated. I'm just gonna call them all Adepti, just for ease of use. I know they're not all the same. But bottom line, Yaksha, Adepti, and Illuminated Beasts are all different flavors of the same thing, so gotta call them all Adepti. Don't at me. So, the Illuminated Beast species as a whole is most heavily associated with Morax, which makes this next observation a little bit confusing. See, we have these giant statues littered all over Liyue, right? They're in Lisha, Mount Tianhong, Minlin, Luhua. It turns out all of these are Yaksha statues, so illuminated beast statues, whatever that means. Whether they're used by the Yaksha or they're supposed to be of the Yaksha, I have no idea, but they're Yaksha statues, which means that they should mark a type of ancient dwelling for the illuminated beast race kind of thing, or at least the like Yakshas, right? Which would put Yakshas at Mount Tianhong where Morax was, and we don't really actually have any records of Yaksha being there prior to the Archon War, but I digress. The statues kind of make sense at the foot of Mount Tianhong, just because our illuminated beasts have already kind of made this point, so they make sense to be here since Morax was the prime of the Adepti, and you know, just having statues in his territory does make sense. But then all of these Yaksha statues appear all over Lisha, and even then up into Minlan, which would be incredibly weird unless these ruins that the Yaksha statues occupy were also dwellings for illuminated beasts in general, not just ones that were associated with Morax. 
But if you look closer at the architecture of all of these ruins in Liyue, there is only one type. They are exactly the same. They are identical. Which is just confusing, because at the very least, we know that there were two gods, Guizhong and Morak, so there should be at least two types of architecture, one type to express the aesthetics of each god. And since Guizhong pointed a crossbow at some other settlements in Lisha, we can assume that there should be even more than just the two gods, because why else would you point a weapon over there? Like, you would have to have, like, a god-like entity to threaten you, right? So, more types of gods mean that there should be more types of architecture, more than two types, and there's not even two types, there's only one type, which is weird. Because in other regions, that is not the case. Consider, Andreas's arena, it's pretty different from Decarabian city of old Mondstadt. Like, they have very different aesthetics, even though they're both kind of, I don't want to call it celtic E, but they've got like the not worky thing going on, but it's, they're still very different, and both of them are, again, different from the ruins at Sol Vindignir, right? They're just different. And as much as I would like to use Inazuman ruins as another example, I can't really because all of the ruin ruins on like Narukami Island are, you know, the same as the ones on Sol Vindignir, which is like a totally different discussion that we're not going to focus on right now. But if I was to point out like really, really old sealed kind of ruiny things, we could look at Seirai Island versus Surumi Island. And those are also kind of different from each other, at least somewhat aesthetically. And even then, those ruins are pretty different from the very, very, very sparse ruins that you find all over Watatsumi Island. And we know for a fact that Orobashi ruled that area, right? And since he ruled that area, it should fit his aesthetic, sort of. Which means that the other regions should have fit like a slightly different aesthetic. Maybe not like the god's specific aesthetic, but you know what I mean? Like, like an aesthetic based on your god. Like, that's probably a better way to put it. But the, the point is here that they're different, right? They're all different, but Liwa only has one type of ruin. That's not the Salvendignir ruins, because those are everywhere. We're not talking about those. And yeah, okay, sure, I will grant you that the ruins at Liwei are a little bit different from each other, but not in design, in layout, which I don't really think counts too much. For example, like, Xingshu Pool is basically a circular tower-like ruin, whereas Lingju Pass is more boxy and open, and no two ruins have the exact same layout, but they all do have the exact same Yaksha statues of varying sizes, building materials, and definitely design elements. Logically, then, the differences in layout might suggest, to me at least, that each city ruin settlement thing was constructed to the taste of a different god or maybe a depti, but then they shared an architectural style, which suggests that these settlements were at least part of a larger collaborative system. So even though there was like maybe one god ruling each little settlement area, they all kind of worked as like a collaborative network, therefore they all shared the same architectural aesthetic. It would be something kind of like, uh, like a, like a, like a feudal empire, kind of, sort of? That's probably a really bad comparison. But like a system wherein each city has its own respective lord, and then that lord reports back to someone of a higher class or rank, and then the lords would have retainers, and obviously the citizens in the designated territory that they would then rule over, like a fiefdom or something. So to use Morax as an example, Morax would be the lord, his adepti companions, like Mooncarver would be his retainers, and Mount Tianhung and the surrounding area would be his territory. So what's interesting about this concept is that it kind of starts to recontextualize what happened in Liwa during the Archon War, and the relationship that each god technically had to each other. So remember how Guizhong set up a list of pointing towards Lisha? Well, Lisha has three whole settlements. In the event that Mount Tianhung would be invaded, it's very likely that the invasion would have come from Lisha because it's the next closest kind of thing, right? Unless it comes from the ocean, in which that's like a totally different argument, but... Then the real question becomes, why is there a threat of invasion to begin with if this is like one big collaborative system? Well, we have to have a little history lesson for this one. So after doing a little bit of research, the governing structure that I appear to have been suggesting here is kind of based on Feng Shan, or an infestment system, it's somewhere from the 8th or 9th century. Basically, this would have been like a decentralized system of government where there was a king situated at the top and then a selection of noble clans below him. Each noble clan would then be assigned an area of land which they would then govern like an autonomous state. 
Now, in theory, every noble clan would have answered back to the king, but historically, the king's power would dwindle over time until each noble clan decided, hey, screw this guy, and then decided to name themselves as kings of smaller kingdoms, which then leads to all sorts of conflicts as these new self-proclaimed kings vie for power. It Interestingly, and I know this is from like a completely separate time period, but I do think that the ruins at Lingzhu Pass have a fairly similar or at least reminiscent layout to the Palace of the Forbidden City in China. And I'm thinking that that might have been the domain of the so-called king. He would have been, you know, obviously the first to go, because what cocky subordinate doesn't want to overthrow their boss, right? That's always a thing. In addition, there are books in game that talk about a sea king that ruled over the Lisha area, but it's not totally clear if he was real or if this book is really just describing a myth. But the area of Lisha did get flooded sometime during the Archon War, just like it says in the book, so it's possible that there are some grains of truth to his existence, or at least something like him. Plus, Morax ended up beating at least three different sea monster god things over the years, so having the king of Liyue originally be a sea king would explain why there are so many sea monsters. But it's equally possible that the king would have just been Celestia, but we'll talk about that. Just give me a minute. Anyway, like I said before, having a bunch of cocky nobles declaring themselves kings would make any sensible person of power a little bit nervous. Like, you know, Gui Zhang. In this context, her proposal to Morax was actually sensible. Together, they would create a show of strength by dominating two regions and combining their resources into the Guili Assembly. Most nobles would think twice about flexing their muscles at the Guili Assembly for this reason. The Guizhong Ballista stationed at Mount Tianhong was likely more of a warning sign than anything else, although I'm totally confident that it worked. You know, it, it's gotta be functional. So I imagine that while it's likely that the Guili Plains were rather peaceful, the same could not be said for the rest of Liwe, which was probably full of skirmishes even pre-Archon War. That's my guess, it's an assumption. And Morax has stated himself several times that he does not desire domination. He doesn't exactly enjoy bloodshed, although he is rather quick to resort to violence. For that reason, it's probably safe to assume that Gui Zhang's proposal to him was probably quite appealing because he probably didn't want to participate in the power struggle. He was probably kind of forced into it when Gui Zhang was killed and then the Guili assembly was flooded, you know. And then he would have barely recouped all of his losses and then resettled his, all of the survivors when Celestia gave the gods of Liwa even more reasons to duke it out. A seat in the heavens. Um, or a gnosis. We're not entirely sure which. Or if they're the same thing, they might be. We don't know that. And uh, Morax may have been a bit of a meathead, like I said, but it's not like he enjoyed the slaughter, like I also said. He's never been keen on watching people suffer, so ultimately he was forced to join in the fight to think he could mitigate losses through a violent show of force. Flex your muscles, no one challenges you. Peace, right? Easy peasy. Nice solution. But the fact that he won, and that most of the gods would have had to die or be sealed in his hand, just makes the whole thing feel a lot more bitter when you realize that these gods that he was fighting would have been the same people that he would have stood shoulder to shoulder with and ruled amicably alongside before all of this. So that would make him the last heir to the Celestial Throne standing. Now, is there more evidence for this? Yes and no. Yes, because I have more to add, but no, because what I have to add is more speculation and slight like conjecture and all that kind of stuff. So, in the book Stone Tablet Compilations Volume 1, it says that Rex Lapis, aka Morax, descended. But in the original Chinese, the term for descended is far more specific. I'll put a segment on the screen because I do not trust my pronunciation. I barely trust it for single words. Now I have gotten mixed translations on this because the terminology here is actually kind of vague, it's just probably intentional, uh, and also Chinese is just really hard to directly translate into English. But what every translation seems to agree on is that the term is vague. <laughs> Funny. Uh, it can either mean he literally descended from the sky, or that he was demoted from his current position and therefore descended, or he was assigned a task to carry out. Note that all three meanings can be true at the same time, however, I am most inclined towards the last meaning of assignment in light of what we've already discussed above, the idea that Morax was part of some sort of dynasty and granted territory to rule over. Incidentally, this segment, on screen now, can be used to refer to the sons of an emperor being sent or assigned their own fiefdoms, which also plays into the aforementioned theory. As for real-life Chinese history, of which I am by no means well-versed or should be considered an expert in, and I will probably get corrected many, 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 many times in the comment. I did notice that the Tang Dynasty in particular, which is around the 8th century, I think, 
has a lot of similarities with the conflicts of early Liwa, or at least the ones that I'm suspecting right now. If we assume that Morax is like the first Tang Emperor, Li Wan, then some neat stuff starts to pop up. Li Wan governed over the eastern region originally and then expanded north, just like Morax did, before overcoming other rivals through military might, just like Morax did. Li Wan also created mints and coinage, establishing new laws and ushering in a sort of golden age for China. Again, very similar to Morax, who created Mora, the Golden House, which is technically a mint, and also creating new systems of law as per his ideal of contracts and probably the introduction of the Liyue Qixing. There are a shocking amount of additional parallels, but I'm gonna just leave some links in the description if you want to read more about it. I just thought this bit was cool and I wanted to share. Now, as for additional in-game support, I would like to point out the Tiara set, which explicitly mentions the Envoys of Heaven. Now, I've long assumed the Envoys of Heaven to be Seelies, which were supposedly, you know, all things that died, along with the Moon Sisters and the Lunar Palace, but now I'm not so sure. We know from multiple sources that Seelies were supposed to guide humanity, and guess what? That's also what Morax was supposed to do. And, of course, that's what all of the Archons were supposed to do, originally. So, now I'm wondering if Morax did, in fact, descend from the Lunar Palace to take up his assignment in southeastern Liyue to guide humanity at the behest of Celestia or some equivalent power. That would certainly explain why one of the only consistent prerequisites for becoming the Archon was a deep love of humanity, rather than just strength. Otherwise, there would be no reason for Barbados to be the Archon over Andreas or Makoto to be the Archon over A because they're, you know, just weaker. And Morax was the last one standing and also loved people, but I'm pretty convinced that if Guizhong had lived, it's likely that she would have had been the Archon in his place. Which is kind of weird to think about. Anyway, that's all I've got for now. Just some thoughts have been spinning around in my head as I work on much bigger, more complex theory based on some similar ideas. Consider this a, um, preview of sorts. So, thanks again for watching. I'll see you all in the next one. Take care. Bye!